The liturgical season of Advent has now come and gone. And here we stand, looking into the eyes of another year. 2020 was certainly not what most of us had hoped it would be, but we've made it through. In a recent study, it was found that only those who were Christians made it through this last year with unchanged or improved mental health. All others saw a decline in their mental health and their outlook on life. What makes the difference? Are Christians really that much different than the rest of humanity? The answer is, is of course not. We are of the same flesh and blood. So what's the difference? I must say it's the one and only true God. It is God who lives in the hearts of believers that makes the difference. But where does that put us? I believe that it puts us in a state of prayerfulness. And thus we begin our next series. Looking back at the year we came through and looking forward to the year ahead, we begin to dive into great prayers of the Bible. If you'll please stand with me and open your Bibles to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Amen. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Amen, Lord. And blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my Savior. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous and burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Father, we thank you for your word. 
for the great prayers that are within it that can teach us and guide us in, in how we ought to pray. Lord, let this be a teaching tool today. In your name, amen. If your Bible is anything like mine, it probably has the author written at the top of each of the psalms. And it may even give a little theme or a description of the reason for this psalm being written. The author of this one is David. He wrote many, maybe even most, of the psalms. David is a character that most of us know at least a little bit about. We first come to knowledge, acknowledge him when he stands against the great Goliath. But he had also killed a lion and a bear before that in order to protect his father's sheep. David was then ascended and was eventually anointed king of Israel. He led the people through a civil war and men through many victories over many of the surrounding nations, including the Philistines, the Geshurites, the Gezites, the Jebusites, and the Amalekites. He appeared to be a great king that was following the will of the Lord. And accomplishing all that he set out to do. And yet, he was still just a man. And he fell into temptation. What was this temptation? Bathsheba. The woman that he had an affair with got pregnant and then had her husband killed in order to cover up the affair. Kind of sounds like a normal day in Washington, D.C., but I digress. David knew what he had done was wrong on many accounts. Which leads us to this prayer in Psalm 51. This psalm can be broken down into a few sections. And we will study each of those this morning. The first one being a cry for mercy. The second one being an admission. The third being a cleansing. The fourth being restoration and renewing. The fifth being repentance. And ending with national restoration. The first two verses are David's cry for mercy. He cries out to the only one who can help him. He's in desperate need of divine forgiveness. His sin has disrupted the fellowship that he once shared with the Lord, and now he has no right to divine blessings. But David cries out not to be forgiven on his own merit, but according to God's unfailing love and great compassion. His own deeds are not calling for, are not worthy of forgiveness. But he serves a God who is compassionate and loving. We too are not deserving of any sort of forgiveness. Which is why it's called mercy. Amen. God is well within his right. And it is true justice to punish us to the nth degree. But he continues to pour out mercy. And David knows that this is his one and only hope. He can't seek out forgiveness from the, the nation of Israel. He can't seek out forgiveness from Nathan because Nathan, not Nathan. Bathsheba's husband is dead. He can't seek out forgiveness from him. He's not there anymore. He could try to seek it from Bathsheba, but it wouldn't do any good in the long term. Because there's only one who provides divine forgiveness. If God does not blot out his transgressions and forgive him, then he is done for. 
And David sees his desperate need to be cleansed once again. In verse 2, there's a realization here that every sinner must come to recognize, understand, and believe. It starts in, right there in verse 2, but expands to the following verses, which begins our look into the admission. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, and you only have I sinned and done, and done what is evil in your sight. What has David so clearly stated here that is a struggle for most people, and especially children? He has taken responsibility for his actions. Nowhere in this psalm does David blame his actions on anyone else. But if we were to take a look back to the original sin, Adam immediately cast blame on God and Eve. And then Eve immediately cast blame on the serpent. We have been self-deceiving since nearly the beginning of time. And if you ask me, it's something that has only gotten worse throughout the ages. I won't even get into the despicable attitudes that are held by so many people today. And I, I believe you know exactly what I'm speaking of. There's a reason that we have the attitude or the stereotype that I'm an American, it's not my fault. Nothing is ever my fault. It's that guy. He did it. He made me do it. But David did not do that. He did not blame Bathsheba. He did not blame the servants who brought Bathsheba to him. He did not blame the builders for building her sun tanning area right below his view. He didn't even try to blame God. He didn't say, God, you put me as king, and then this palace is for the king, and, and you knew that her sun tanning area was there, and I would be here, and I would see her, and you see, God, you, you should have built this palace somewhere else. He didn't do that. There is a freeing power in the truth. When we recognize our own faults, failures, and sinful deeds, it does not serve to captivate us further and to, to strengthen the stranglehold on us. It actually frees us to pursue the cleansing, forgiving power of God. David spouted so much doctrinal truth in this short prayer. We are sinful at birth. And at the time of conception. I once worked with a guy. And he said, I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that children sin. And I, 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 I don't believe that, that they're inherently sinful. He said, I believe they have to be taught how to do things. They have to be taught how to lie. They have to be taught how to, to, to sin. And I, I said, did you teach your children how to lie? He goes, well, no, I didn't. Then where did they learn it from? Because they started lying before they ever went to school. They didn't learn it at school. Where did they learn it? And him and I went back and forth on it. For quite a few hours, actually, as we were at work. And, and he, he was one of those individuals that it didn't matter how much evidence you brought, how much doctrinal, scriptural truth that you brought to him. He had his mind set, and that's just the way it was. So eventually I gave up. But the fact is, we are sinful from the time of conception. 
Because that curse that came from Adam and Eve has been passed down from generation to generation, and no one has escaped it. Amen. God knows that, but he still desires for us to be faithful and seek out his wisdom. Humans are totally, completely depraved. There is not a person, there, there is not a moment in a person's life where a switch is flipped from good to bad. We are born depraved and in need of a savior. But in that, David also draws out that God is just. Making it very clear that all of God's judgments and verdicts are correct. There's no need for an appeal and then another appeal and to work its way up to the Supreme Court. When God speaks, it is final. It is the most correct and, and just verdict that has ever been spoken. And David does not stop simply with admitting his sin, admitting that he had sinned and that he was sinful. But he understands that it is only through outside revelation that the inside can become whole. And that outside revelation is the wisdom of God that is revealed to us by himself. And thus David continues with his need for cleansing, verses 7 through 9. It says, clean me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. The cleansing ritual of the time was for the priest. When they were satisfied that the unclean person had met the requirements for purification, they would take a plant, which was called hyssop, and they would dip it in water and then they would sprinkle it on the person and as a symbol of being pure, as being clean. But David didn't seek out human ideas and representation of purification. David is asking for God to be the priest and to cleanse him not from just that sin, but from all sin. Amen. The high priest. Washing him whiter than snow. And once he is clean, he wants to hear joy and gladness. I believe that when we are burdened under sin, that we cannot see the beauty of nature as clearly or hear the beauty of music as clearly as when our sins and our burdens are lifted. I think it's one of God's small gifts here on earth for those who have been forgiven. That we see things differently. We see brighter greens. The, the, the flowers are more, more colorful, more crisp. Music has a different tone in our ear. All because we have accepted the Lord and been forgiven. Verse 9 is, is pretty interesting. What does it mean for the Lord to hide his face from my sins and to blot out my iniquity? We know that to blot out means to erase from the record. But for God to hide his face means to receive a complete and effectual pardon. David is requesting that God not be provoked by those sins and to not deal with him as he deserves. In other words, he's saying, God, have mercy. Have mercy on me, O oh God. Ignore, blot out, erase my sins of the past so that I can hear joy and gladness once again. But it doesn't stop there. 
He wants restoration. He wants renewing. David continues with a prayer for sanctifying grace. He is not concerned with his reputation or appearance to others. He simply desires for his corrupt nature to be changed. It's almost like he just come to a real or a new realization of just how unclean his heart really is. And he already knows that the power that is needed to change it is not within him alone. Which is why he cries out to the Lord for a new heart. Because it is only the one who made the heart that could make it new. Not only did he desire for a new heart, but he also desired a steadfast spirit that would hold true to God and not poison the new heart that God had blessed him with. With this new heart and steadfast spirit, David wanted God to continue his good works in and through him. Not to abandon and deprive him of God's grace. But David knew that the Lord would have been right for taking away the Holy Spirit. Because David had grieved the Holy Spirit. But he pleaded with God. That there would be a restoring to the joy of salvation. Because as we know, it is the Holy Spirit that ministers with our spirit and gives us the blessed assurance that we are saved. And it's also the same spirit that sustains our spirit to keep us from sinning. That sanctifying grace. But he's been renewed. And he doesn't want to go back to the things that he was doing. He wants to move forward with God, which is where we get to the repentance. This section, I believe, is, is a moment of repentance. Because it's, it is in the likes of a repentant heart. Because one who has truly sought forgiveness will lead a different life than they were living before. They will seek out a life that is glorifying to the Lord and that will lead other sinners to the Lord. And anyone who has received divine deliverance cannot help but to sing and declare the praises of the Lord. I know there are churches out there where if you get saved, you have to come down to the front of the sanctuary at the next service, whether it be a Wednesday night or a Sunday evening. You have to come down to the front of the sanctuary, take the microphone in your hand, and proclaim that you have been saved. You have to testify that you've been saved. Otherwise, they think it didn't really happen. Now, I think there's some good in proclaiming to the rest of the church that you have been saved. Amen. Because how are we supposed to know... Exactly when you got saved if you don't tell us. We want to rejoice with you. We want to praise the Lord with you. We want to be as the angels in heaven who rejoice when a sinner comes home. But I don't think you have to force someone who's been saved to proclaim it. Someone who has really received a salvation and has turned away from their wickedness and has known that they have been forgiven will want to proclaim their salvation to anyone and everyone who will even hear them. Whether they're listening or not. Because when that burden is lifted from you, it's shout time. But David goes a step further, and he asks that the guilt of bloodshed be removed from him. And the guilt of bloodshed can mean a couple different things. The first being the release from a grave sin that requires the death penalty. 
And a second being a sin that led to the death of an innocent person. In David's case, both were true. Adultery was punishable by death. And David caused Bathsheba's husband, an innocent man, to be killed in battle. Also punishable by death. If God were to deliver one from guilt, it would be all one could do to sing of his righteousness. He then continues and says, The Lord, you do not delight in sacrifices or burnt offerings. Well, the question might be asked, then why would God made it part of the law that they were to bring sacrifices? It's because it's about more than the sacrifice itself. It's not about the dove. It's not about the cow or the sheep or the goat. It's not about the animal that's on the altar. It's about the state of the person who brings forth the sacrifice. About the state of their heart. If one brings forth a sacrifice simply because he is supposed to, it means nothing. But if one brings it with a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, and with humility, that pleases God. It shows that they are truly repentant for what they have done. And it is humility that is the prerequisite for spiritual renewal, which is also the prerequisite for a walk with God. If you have not humbled yourself before the Lord, you will not experience spiritual renewal. And without spiritual renewal, you will not walk with God. But David continues. It seems that the psalm could have ended there. When David says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Seems right there we could just say, amen. Yet David continued for a national, a prayer for national restoration. But, but where does this prayer of Nash for the nation fit into his very personal prayer of penitence? It's in the fact that David's sin is so closely related with the community identification of Israel. Because all of Israel had been adulterous against God. As the leadership goes, so goes the people. And this is something that had been building for generations. And thus David cries out for the nation to be restored. It would take a work of the Lord to rebuild the walls and to resort, restore Zion to what it ought to be. There are some who believe that these last two verses were actually added after the exile that we talked about in Isaiah. And they may think that because that is when the walls were rebuilt and Jerusalem was restored. A day when the Israelites would once again be committed to God and offering righteous sacrifices to a righteous God. This prayer, in its entirety, is, is a, a template for us. I am not a fan of the quote-unquote sinner's prayer. I don't believe that there's one prayer that you can pray and then it's all done for. You're good to go. 
You're in the Lamb's Book of Life. Blot out the rest. You're on your merry way. Until we have this attitude that David had in this moment when he knew what he had done and he brought his sin before God and saying, God, you are the only one who can save me. You're the only one who can forgive me. Then our hearts are not in the right place. And until our hearts are in the right place, we cannot receive salvation. The world wants you to build yourself up, wants you to climb the ladder to gain more and more and more and to reach greater and higher levels in everything that you do. When all the Lord asks you to do is get on your knees and humble yourself before me and pray. That's all he asks. For humility. Quit blaming everyone else for the things that you have done, the things that you have said, and blame yourself because it is you who made the action, you who made the decision to do it. Get on your knees and pray. Turn away from the wicked and turn toward the righteous. Get on your knees and pray. Let's stand. Amen. Father, we cry out to you. We cry out for mercy. Have mercy, Lord. Father, we need your forgiveness. We need your love. We need your compassion. Father, we have been wicked from the moment of our conception. Yet you loved us. And you continue to love us even when we were not friends of yours, but yet we were enemies despising you. Lord, let us not be deceived by the, the culture of the church today. Let us not be deceived by the culture of the world and of our nation today. Let those seeking salvation, let those seeking sanctification go to your word and see what it says and pursue it in the biblical way. For all other ways will lead us to despair and deceit. Father, humble us. As we go into this new year, Lord, put us on our knees. Put us on our face before you. That we would know you are the only reason we are here. Father, we cling to you. The one true, steadfast, unchanging God. Let us have the heart of David, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart that clings to your word. Father, speak. As we leave from this building today, Lord, may you minister to our hearts until we return again. May you lead someone into our path that we can share our testimony with, that we can share the gospel, the good news with, so that you may receive all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' precious name.